<laughs> all right, everybody. Nice turnout. Thanks a lot more than we anticipated, but fantastic to have you all. Who's actually come to um, a talk on low carbohydrate nutrition before or been to any talk? Doesn't have to be in one here. Put your hands up high. You must be proud that you've been to one of these things. Okay, that's, that's excellent. So who's never been to one before? That's the next question. Who's never? Oh, that's a good spread. Okay, that's brilliant. And the reason I asked that question is that tonight's presentation will have to incorporate some of the uh, subject material that those of you who have been before have heard before because there's lots of new guys who've never heard it before. Okay, and the, the ultimate essence and the message in what we are trying to spread hasn't changed despite our attendance at the World Convention um, in Cape Town recently. If anything, this World Conference 2015 absolutely rubber-stamped and cemented and consolidated that everything that we have been saying about low-carbohydrate nutrition and health is correct. And it is going to be the nutrition of the future, and it is going to be, to a large extent, constitute a lot of medical interventions in lifestyle diseases of the future. So I'm going to address probably a lot more briefly than we did for, for previous talks the, the real kernel of science that, that uh, underpins low-carbohydrate nutrition. And then I'm going to share with you, and this was certainly those of you who've come before, some of the interesting features that came out of the World Conference recently. When we finish the presentation this evening, our um, nutrition business partners, our next door pizzeria, Cirellas are going to be bringing up some low-carbohydrate snacks, and I think they're charging five bucks for those. And any of you who want to have a, a go at some low-carbohydrate nutrition, you're most welcome to, to come and share in that afterwards. I think that will be out there on the veranda. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, we will have a question time at the end as well. So uh, for those who have time to stay at the end and listen to all the questions, please do. But if there's a burning question and you want to put your hand up and ask it, it might be that I haven't got to that bit yet, in which case I'll just ask you to hold that thought. It might be that I'm unable to ask, answer your question, in which case I'll ask Val to answer it for you. And it might be... <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll, we'll get to those. All right, so welcome to you all. So quite recently, my wife Debbie and myself had uh, the very good fortune to attend the First World uh, Conference on low-carb nutrition, which was sponsored by the Old Mutual in Cape Town. These are a collection of the world authorities in this area, from the USA, from the UK, from Australia, from Sweden, uh, Canada, and they were a, a very entertaining and very enlightening bunch of world experts who spent four days in Cape Town presenting their research and information to doctors and nutritionists and medical professionals for three days and then to the public on the final day of the conference in Avril. Uh, Bear went to the public day, I didn't go to that, and, and she said that was absolutely excellent, which doesn't surprise me because the caliber of these individuals is absolutely excellent. And really the, the fundamental message is that the biggest medical challenge that we face Currently, and certainly in first world countries, and it is a growing and increasing trend in developing countries, are diseases of lifestyle. In South Africa and in Zimbabwe, 2012, the WHO showed us very clearly that diseases of lifestyle, obesity, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, now exceed the death rates of HIV. Right, so HIV, this big global problem for the developing world in Africa, has been superseded by what was there before. And in a way, we kind of have been so focused on the issue of HIV, we didn't really see this coming. So don't think this is just a problem of the first world. So lifestyle diseases are a major health challenge at the individual level and at the population level. The increasing message and lesson is that lifestyle diseases hinge predominantly on food, on our nutrition, on our diet, not diet in the reference term of doing something to lose weight, our overall nutrition. And that there are several interlinks between all of these diseases of lifestyle, commonalities between them, that also all come back to the subject of nutrition. 
So this evening, what I'd hope to do, <clears throat> to share with you, to update you on, or remind you of, are the roles of dietary carbohydrate and fats in something we call insulin resistance, which we're going to talk about. The lifestyle diseases, the main ones, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Dispel some of the myths that you might have about fats and something called cholesterol. Share with you a few pearls of healthy dietary advice, but they're going to be a few because otherwise, if you want to hear them all, we can stay here till midnight. And share with you on the way and towards the end of the presentation some of the more interesting updates from the World Conference. But again, to remind you, that was a four-day conference. We have a 60-minute presentation, so I will share some of the highlights with you. So we have a changing world. TVs are <clears throat> getting thinner and we're not. In reality, the greatest lifestyle threat to mankind currently is the modern day epidemic of obesity, which affects adults and children alike. It has tripled in first world countries in a generation. The rates of obesity have tripled in a generation from 1980 until today. Tripled. We are looking at projections now by the WHO that by 2030, one in two adults will be obese. One in three children will be obese. 2030, what year are we in? 2015. They're wrong, it'll be 2040 or 2050, but the, probably the year doesn't really matter. It's the future is foretold. If we carry on at a rate of weight-challenged people, which has tripled in 25 years and will continue to increase at a faster rate in the next 15 to 25 years. So the, the fundamental question is why are we getting fatter? And Blaze, don't whinge to me about this picture. Where are you, Blaze? <laughs> uh, Blaze. Right. So why are we getting bigger? So what do we know about human evolution and development? Well, we know for the greater part of two and a half to three million years, if you subscribe to scientific evolution theory, we were hunter-gatherers eating a predominantly meat, protein, fat-based diet with intermittent exposure to, to vegetables, very infrequent exposure to fruits in season, and once in a while when we were brave enough to chase the bees away from the honey, we might have had access to a little bit of honey. We certainly didn't go to Bon Marche in the supermarket and buy it every single day in unlimited proportions. Then about 12 to 15,000 years ago, we learned to harvest, grow wild grasses, which, we, which became modern grains and modern wheat and other grains. And in the last 200 years, we developed an agro-industrial-based food processing industry so we could take the crops from the ground and make them into foodstuffs that we could process, box, and sell in various retail outlets. But in fact, if you look at the greatest change in human shape that we are looking at from a health point of view, it's taken place in the last 25 to 35 years. It's a very, very small time frame in human existence. So what has changed in that particular time frame is the advocacy for us as a species from a public health point of view to live in fear of fat because that supposedly causes intractable damage to our hearts, and by default, therefore, to eat a higher carbohydrate diet. And so in 1977, the Americans produced guidelines, and, and, and after that, a food pyramid, which still exists today. We're waiting for the 2015 guidelines to come out. But if you look at the base of this pyramid, it is basically essentially carbohydrate-based foods, everything from bread to starches to vegetables to fruits, the bulk of that, constituting up to 58% of our total calories, we have been told for the last generation to eat those from carbohydrates and to really minimize our fats, especially saturated fats. We've been encouraged to change those to polyunsaturated fats. We were convinced to swap butter for margarine. And increasingly, the agro-industrial food industry 
made carbohydrates cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to produce. So as we stand today, carbohydrates are the cheapest and easiest way to feed ourselves individually and at community and population level. And that is a fundamental problem that I don't have all the answers to because carbohydrates are a cheap way to live. However, if we contrast the way that we eat now to the way that we used to eat, if we just look at these pie charts, I don't want to show you too much science, but pie charts are sometimes interesting. This is the current carbohydrate content of our diet, as I said, somewhere around about 58, 60%, which is what the World Food Guidelines have recommended for the last 25 years. Look at the carbohydrate that we reasonably accurately estimate our ancestors ate, about 5%. Okay. Current fat content recommended in the diet less than 25%. And the estimate is that our ancestors ate fat constituting up to 75% of their calories way back when. So there's a substantial difference in our macronutrient content of our diet. Put it very simply, we're simply eating more and more and more carbohydrate and most of what we're eating comes in the form of that yummy, yummy stuff called sugar. So if you have a look at a chart of human consumption of sugar, you will see this exponential rise in our consumption of sugar in the last 100 years. Tucked in the corner of this graph, I have just put the human consumption of protein and fat over the last 40 years. And you'll notice protein consumption hasn't changed very much. But very interestingly, fat consumption has actually gone down. So in America, fat consumption over the last 30 years has gone down by about 11%. So we can't blame the obesity epidemic on fat intake. That, in all population research, is there before you. We've not eat, we're not eating more and more fat. We're getting fatter, but we're eating more and more carbohydrate and sugar. So that, in itself, is a very strong association. If we look at the traditional model that we've all subscribed to for generations and which has been taught, which are many doctors and dietitians still will tell you as a very simple model of why we gain weight. It's about doing too little exercise, eating too much, and the consequence of that is we gain weight. But I'm going to show you this evening that is a biologically unsound model. It doesn't work. It's not that simple. And it takes away the complex biology of human physiology. We're not just a simple abacus or mathematical counting machine, calories in, calories out, excess, deposit, gain weight. It doesn't work like that. We are far more complex than that. So obesity is not a disorder of calories alone. What we understand now is that weight gain, and the more weight you gain, the more this is a problem, is a metabolic disorder. It's not a calorie disorder. And it is much more to do with how much sugar and carbohydrate is in our diet. The effect of that nutrient on a very important hormone in our body called insulin. And the net effects of that cycle being a net fat gain in susceptible individuals. So the message at this point, which we'll go on to try and back up, is it's not only how much you eat. We fully accept that to gain significant amounts of weight, one has to eat significant amounts of calories. But what is more important than the total amount of calories that we are eating is what we are eating and what our bodies do with what we eat. So what we eat and what we do with what we eat are more important factors in weight gain than how much. So just to get on the same page as far as carbohydrates are concerned, we all understand that carbohydrates are a, a, a group of macronutrients that comprise starches, sugars, vegetables, fruits, and Rice Krispies. We're all happy what carbohydrates are. Okay. There's a couple of quick facts that uh, we all need to understand about carbs. So we're going to shorten carbohydrates to carbs. It'll shorten this presentation by at least an hour. All sugars are carbs. All carbs are made of sugars. So any 
carb or carbohydrate food stuff is simply a chain of sugars. Different sugars, different chains, different lengths. But they are all made up of sugars. Therefore, when we break down carbohydrates in our body, we make them into sugars. We break them down to sugars because that's essentially what they constitute. Some carbohydrates will digest very quickly to sugar in our bodies. Some will do it slower. And carbohydrates as a fuel for our bodies are actually a very poor fuel because they have a very low energy density. There's only four calories per gram in carbohydrates. That's not a very high quality fuel when we talk about fuel that we can obtain from food as we'll see going forward. So carbohydrates, as much as we like them and as much as we eat lots of them, and as much as athletes think that they're the primary and best fuel ever invented for exercise, they are in fact a very poor quality fuel. So what happens to uh, the carbohydrates that that gentleman is about to enjoy with his dinner, most of which are contained in the ketchup? I will challenge any of you to prove that there is a tomato in that bottle in any form and in that yummy wheat-based white bread roll. Those are the carbs. So what happens when those carbs go through his intestine? Well, as we said, they're simply broken down to the simple sugars which constitute that carb. And the two commonest simple sugars in any food, in most foods, are glucose and fructose, or fructose. You've all heard of glucose. You've probably all heard of fructose. You associate fructose, I'm sure, with fruit sugar. What you may not know is that when we look at table sugar, which is sucrose, it constitutes 50% fructose and 50% glucose. And if you look at most processed foodstuffs, certainly in the USA, increasingly so in this part of the world, they use a product called high fructose corn syrup, which is made from corn, obviously. It's much cheaper to produce than sugar, and it's as sweet if not sweeter. And it contains slightly more fructose. It's also a combination of glucose and fructose, but it contains slightly more fructose. So when we digest sugar in the form of sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, we end up with glucose and fructose. And there are certain world authorities with good research to back up what they say who will tell you that fructose is probably the most toxic of all sugars. That fructose is probably the sugar in our diet that does most of the damage to the body when we talk about diseases of lifestyle. We don't know at a metabolic level what to do with lots of fructose in the body. It's a very poor fuel uh, for exercise. We will only actually utilize less than 20% of fructose at any point in time. 80% of fructose that enters the human body goes straight to the liver and as I'll show you just now is converted straight to fat. Fructose is actually metabolized very similar to the way in which we metabolize alcohol. And there's an endocrinologist in the USA called <clears throat> Robert Lustig. You should look him up. He's got some wonderful YouTube um, lectures and some good articles, and he's a big expert in fructose metabolism. And he poses an interesting question in one of his lectures. He says that fructose and alcohol at a metabolic level ignore the effects of alcohol on your brain that make you a bit silly, those of you who are going to turn roof later, ignore that effect. But the metabolic effects of alcohol and fructose in the human body are actually exactly the same. We metabolize alcohol and fructose exactly the same. So his challenge to us is if you, if, if you won't give your children alcohol, then why on earth do you give them fructose? Because the effects on the human body are almost identical. It's a very good question. So when sugar hits the human bloodstream, the glucose component of any sugar that we have taken in or any carbohydrate will raise our blood sugar. So here's a question for you. How much sugar do you think you have in your bloodstream at any point in time? Let's just say sort of in between meals, not after eating that sticky bun. Any, any, any idea? How much sugar do you think your body would like to have in your bloodstream at a resting level? Should we have an auction? We'll do it in teaspoons. 
Okay, anyone give me one. One, one teaspoon going one, 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 one. Give me, give me one. Who will give me one? One, one will go. Richard, you got one. Right, anyone give me two, 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 two going to the... Two, 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 we got two. Two, anyone give me three, 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 three. No, no, no one. Four, we got four on the table. Okay, all right. Between one and two. Probably about 1.5. So, the body would like to keep the blood sugar level at any point in time at around about one and a half teaspoons of sugar. That's where the body's happy. Okay. You're not particularly happy if the blood sugar goes higher than that. It needs to put that blood sugar somewhere. We weren't designed to run around with blood sugars that are three, four, or five teaspoons for any length of time. So when we have that nice donut, our blood sugar will go way up above the one and a half teaspoon level in our bloodstream. And in fact, that donut has probably got somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 grams of sugar in it. Okay, so teaspoon to terms, anything from six to eight teaspoons of sugar in that nice donut, which has a dramatic effect on our blood sugar. So I'm just taking you through the blood sugar story in the body. So we ate it, we ate our carb, we broke it down to glucose and fructose. Most of the fructose is going off to the liver, and the glucose is elevating our blood sugar. Are we happy with the story so far? Mr. Annandale, would I get a teaching job at St. John's at this, at this rate? Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, welcome to the headmaster of St. John's College. Any complaints about St. John's College? To the back, please. Right, there are some foodstuffs, and I mentioned this earlier, some carbohydrates will rapidly raise blood sugar, and some will do it at a slower rate. And that is, has a measurement, and that measurement is called glycemic index, or GI. We love these acronyms in medicine. We sound intelligent. We say GI, and you look at us. Is that an American soldier? No. Okay, it's an index of blood sugar level. So foods that rapidly raise blood sugar are said to have a high glycemic index or high GI. And you'll read through that list and you'll see they all the inverted commas, yummy things that you like. Mostly carbohydrates and mostly refined carbohydrates. On the right of the screen, you have foods that really have a very slow, almost minimal impact on blood sugar. And those would be your whole grain carbs, your rolled oats, and your wild rice, most vegetables, most fruits, most nuts, dairy, meats, fish, and eggs. So those, those foodstuffs will have, as in this lower curve, a much more gentle effect on blood sugar. Less peak elevation and a longer period of time to get the blood sugar up. So what happens next? Blood sugar has gone up slowly or fast, depending on what type of carbohydrate you have taken in. The next physiological effect in human biology of blood sugar elevation is to stimulate your pancreas, which is an organ that sits high up in your abdomen, behind your stomach, to produce the hormone insulin, which I'm sure you have all heard of. So here's someone eating breakfast, lunch, and supper, and the green line is showing that after breakfast, their blood sugar goes up, and there is a corresponding spike in in insulin levels, and the same happens at lunch, and the same happens at supper, because this person is eating some carbohydrate which is being broken down to sugar in each of those meals. We happy so far? Okay. So, what happens to this elevated blood sugar? No longer is the blood sugar sitting at one and a half teaspoons. After that donut, it's sitting at about eight teaspoons. And eight teaspoons is not what the body is designed to operate at in terms of blood sugar. If we're operating at a resting level of eight teaspoons of blood sugar, what disease do we have? You have diabetes. So diabetes is not normal, is it, ma'am? Therefore, having a blood sugar of eight is not normal, is it, ma'am? Right, so the normal human body wants to bring that blood sugar down to where it should be at 1.5 teaspoons. How does it do that? Well, insulin is the moderator. Insulin is the primary regulator of what we do with blood sugar. What insulin will do is it'll pump some of the sugar out of the blood into our livers, and in our livers we can store around about 500 grams um, of, in fact, I'm lying to you, about 100 grams of carbohydrate. We can also store it in our muscles, about 500 grams of carbohydrate. So we can store about 600 grams, if we need to, of carbohydrate in those cupboards, in our liver and our muscle. Okay, so we have one repository for that raised blood sugar. If that 
brings the blood sugar down to resting levels, everybody's happy. However, if we exceed the capacity of those cupboards to store sugar and we still have an elevated resting sugar, then insulin has the ability to put the excess glucose into our livers and our livers will then convert that glucose to fat. So insulin is also the primary regulator of fat metabolism. We all wander around the world thinking that insulin is only about sugar. It's all about fat. So insulin is the modulator. It fills up those cupboards. When there's no more room left in there, it puts the rest into our fat stores. So we can consider insulin as a storage hormone. That's its primary role in the human body. It is to store fuels away. In the main, to make sure that the blood sugar level goes back to a resting level of one and a half teaspoons. Five or six grams. We don't want any more than that. So if that works out, everything's hunky-dory. And meal by meal, and meal to meal, that's what your body is doing with the carbohydrate that comes in. Okay, if there's not a huge amount, and you can store it away, and you're burning it off when you're doing exercise, then you're not going to convert an enormous amount to fat. However, I showed you this earlier. People are getting fatter. So what's happening? Is it only about how much they're eating? No, it is not. There are a large group of us who are very susceptible to a metabolic disorder of this sugar insulin cycle, therefore causing us to gain weight. And why is that? It's because metabolically you can divide the population into two types of people. You can divide them into people who tolerate carbohydrates very well, and they are called carbohydrate tolerant. And there are people who don't tolerate carbohydrates very well, so they are carbohydrate intolerant. We call them carbohydrate resistant. All right, and if you're carbohydrate resistant and you eat lots of carbs, you generally end up looking like that, whereas the carbohydrate tolerant person can eat the same amount of carbohydrates and yet maintain a slender frame. For a period of time, things may change. So that's the first important point. There are two types of people metabolically. Carbohydrate resistance leads to the next physiological abnormality which underpins all diseases of lifestyle, and that is what we now call insulin resistance. So carbohydrate resistance creates insulin resistance, and I'll show you how that fits in in a second. So what the slide is saying in summary is that for this person on the left, carbohydrates are a danger to his health or hers, whereas that individual for the period of time that they remain carbohydrate tolerant <clears throat> Carbohydrates are not at this point in time a significant threat, certainly to their weight, maybe to their future health. Carb resistance has some very key features. First of all, it is embedded in our genetics. So, we are born with carb resistance. It's not necessarily going to reflect itself early in life. It might reflect itself in childhood, adolescent, early adulthood, or late adulthood. It will come on in time. The reason for that is that genes are like switches in an electricity box in your house. Some switches are on and some switches are off. In your body at any point in time, some genes are on and some genes are off. In your carb-resistant genes, if you are maintaining a good weight and eating lots of carbohydrates at a certain stage of life, might simply be off. But one day, something may switch them on, and those are called triggers. And once your carbohydrate genes are switched on, and you maintain a diet that is significantly high in carbohydrates, then there are going to be certain effects on you as a carbohydrate-resistant person whose carbohydrate-resistant genes have been switched on. So the genetics, we currently estimate somewhere between 40 and 65% of people in any population carry, have the genetics for carb resistance. What will turn on the switch, what will trigger those genetics can be age, so we know that carb resistance comes on as people get older, if they have that genetic predisposition, if they eat a diet that is very high in refined carbohydrates and sugar, if they are physically inactive, if they are exposed to periods of high uh, psychosocial stress in their life, especially for periods of time beyond two years, and especially in men, and in women, because we haven't seen a lot of pregnancy and menopause in men recently, in women, we know that pregnancy and menopause are significant triggers for carbohydrate resistance. And menopausal women will testify to that, that that's a difficult time of life to control and maintain weight. And one of the reasons 
that your meta metabolic balance goes out of balance is because resistance often kicks in. There are other features in, in, in menopause to do with the female hormone cycle as well, but carb resistance is a major feature of menopause in many ladies. And once that carb resistance is kicked in, then these are the effects. People gain a lot of weight, usually around the middle, what we call belly fat or central fatness. They can progress to pre-diabetes and to diabetes. They can develop heart disease and high blood pressure. Carb resistance has a role to play in cancer, which I'll share with you um, towards the end of the lecture, and in diseases like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is now classified as a disease of lifestyle, closely connected to diabetes. Diabetics have uh, developed Alzheimer's dementia three times the rate of the rest of the population. Okay, very close connections. Yes, ma'am. Pears and apples, uh, in terms of shapes or fruits? Shapes, yes. So we're talking about apples, yes. Pear-shaped women, it's a good question, where the weight is predominantly in the buttocks and thighs and not so much belly fat, still consider themselves overweight and still stress about that, but it actually has very little impact on future health. That is not a feature of carb resistance. Carb resistance pretty much presents as that central apple obesity. Yeah. So how do you know you're carb resistant? Well, obviously, if you look like that and you're eating lots of carbs, you are currently carbohydrate tolerant, lucky you. And if you are struggling to get those buttons to do up because there is a bulging uh, fat mass in the middle of your body, then you are showing signs of carb resistance for sure. And once we see these kind of um, scales of belly fat, these people are predominantly and profoundly carbohydrate resistant by definition. The progression is to metabolic syndrome, which we call prediabetes, pre which is the association of central obesity, hypertension, elevated blood sugars, and abnormal cholesterol profiles. And from there to diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and all of these, you will find a very strong family history in people who have these conditions. And why do you find a strong family history? Because there's a genetic predisposition. It's in their genes. And the other downside is <clears throat> when ladies who carry a lot of weight and are carb resistant and are obese and who they get pregnant, they prime the child in their uterus to be the same. And fat babies become fat adults. Okay. Okay a large extent driven by genetics, and unfortunately a secondary factor is that when a baby is in the uterus of a very overweight lady, her hormones are priming the baby in utero, priming their pancreas to overproduce insulin, priming that child to be carb resistant at a much younger age usually than the mum was. So it just gets worse. And one of the population fears that was raised at this conference is that with the worldwide escalating epidemic of obesity, are we not simply priming children to be fatter and fatter at a younger age because they're being primed in the uteruses of overweight women? So that may be one of the reasons that this exponential um, increase in childhood obesity is being observed because it is massive. So, we looked at this just now. So, this is the normal profile of blood sugar elevation in response to eating with the associated insulin spikes. This is what happens when someone is carbohydrate resistant. This is the difference. They eat their breakfast, lunch, and supper with carbohydrates, with some refined carbohydrates. The difference is that they develop increasingly a problem of insulin resistance. And insulin resistance says that to have the same effect of insulin on human tissues, their pancreas has to produce more and more insulin. In a way, you can think of it as deafness of the body tissues. The body tissues become deaf to the effects of insulin, therefore you have to turn up the music. Some of you might know that experience. Yes? Okay. So, especially in the muscles and especially in the livers of carbohydrate-resistant individuals, the more they're exposed to refined carbohydrate and elevated blood sugars, the more their muscles and livers become deaf to the effects of insulin. Therefore, their pancreases have to turn the volume up. So they produce more and more insulin to have the same effect that less insulin had five years before that and five years before that. So that's what we term insulin resistance. You happy with that?
So carb resistance produces insulin resistance. So we are seeing, in response to the same carbohydrate intake, much higher spikes of insulin now after breakfast, lunch, and supper in the carb-resistant person. So we see elevated insulin levels, which are the second cardinal feature of carb resistance. Elevated blood sugar associated with elevated insulin levels above normal. So let's come back to our little biology diagram. Here we have the carb-resistant individual eating the sticky bun. Nice high refined carbohydrate intake. Experiencing the high GI dramatic increase in their blood sugar. Insulin is produced in a significantly greater quantum amount because that's what carbohydrate resistant people do because their livers and their muscles are no longer listening. And in not listening, they are no longer accepting the same amount of carbohydrate they were before. The cupboards got smaller. So they can't push as much of that blood sugar into those repositories. So what has to happen to this continued elevation of blood sugar? Where's it got to go? Can't evaporate, can't disappear into the atmosphere. It's got to go somewhere. The body will not allow itself to sit around with elevated levels of blood sugar because there are significant negative effects to that. So you're absolutely right. You gave the magic word. Increasing amounts of sugar are converted to fat. And what happens to the fat stores? They get bigger. And funny enough, when fat stores get bigger around your body, what happens to you? We get bigger. It's amazing, that little concept. But here's the disconnect, what we call cognitive dissonance in world science, nutrition, and medicine. If you ask any nutritionist, dietitian, or scientist about this, there is no debate. At the level of basic exercise physiology, if you feed someone who's carb resistant, a lot of carb, and their blood glucose up, they become insulin resistant, and they convert more and more glucose to fat. Everybody accepts that. But when we try and tell the establishment that that therefore creates fat people, so carb resistance is the reason people get fat. Not the total amount of calories that they're eating or the amount of fat, then they don't understand so we still have, in the scientific community and medical community, a cognitive dissonance factor that says everyone accepts that, but some people still struggle to accept the fact that carb resistance creates obese humans. It creates big fat stores, but we can't understand why it creates big humans. For me, it's very easy to understand because you can see it. Okay? People look like that. So when you have elevated insulin... What we've just looked at is that the sugar that we can't put into our muscles and livers is converted to fat, and we've got this lovely big cupboard in which we can store that fat. It's a nice cupboard. It's an expanding cupboard. You know, we always want expanding cupboards at home to put our things in. Don't we? we always run out of cupboard space. Well, I always do, because Debbie buys more T-shirts and put them in my cupboard. <laughs> so... The fundamental first physiological problem we have is the conversion of sugar to fat and its storage. But there is a second fundamental problem associated with the biological effects of insulin. And that is that insulin controls how much fat will come out of the fat stores. It controls not only what goes in, it controls what comes out. And when insulin levels are very high, it simply puts a padlock on your fat stores. So you can fill the cupboard, but you cannot take it out. So this is an interesting mechanism. We can pour lots of fuel into the fat stores, and we can't get it out. Okay, so second problem in carbohydrate resistance is the fat stores will continue to grow because we can't unlock them or utilize them whilst we are carb-resistant eating a high-carbohydrate-based dietary program. This will be an onward and upward and outward problem. In addition to that, carbohydrates as a macronutrient have profound effects on appetite. And appetite has a profound effect on how much we eat and to an extent what we eat. Because when we're very hungry, what do we go looking for? Nice, yummy, quick things that we can eat, like donuts, and chips. We don't particularly want to take half an hour to go and grill a steak. We just want to eat the first thing that comes to mind or to hand. So... Carbohydrates profoundly affect appetite. They increase appetite. 
because it takes quite a lot of carbohydrate to fill us up. Problem is that it's got a very low amount of energy in carbohydrate food. That means we use it up very quickly. If you've only got four calories per gram, you're going to use it up very quickly. So therefore, we run out of energy very quickly. So every two to three hours, we become hungry when we eat lots of carbohydrates. You can eat as many as we want, but by two to three hours, we've used them all up. So we're hungry again. So we frequently snack, we frequently eat. And if we frequently snack and continue to eat on carbohydrates, then the same cycle will continue. There is another profound effect of carbohydrates, and that is that carbohydrates act like a drug on the brain, fructose being one of the worst. So sugar goes to the brain like heroin does, like opium does. It goes straight to a part of the brain that we call the reward center, and it gives it a little tickle. In fact, it probably gives it a big push. And by pushing and stimulating the brain appetite center, which is called the epistat, it creates increasing hunger and increasing appetite, and in many individuals, it becomes highly addictive. And I will talk about that just now. So sugar addiction is a real deal problem. And hunger is the major problem with appetite stimulation. And there's our little addict. This is one of the updates from the conference. <clears throat> that in weight challenge disorders, there is an added factor now that is coming up in the research, and that is the role of a hormone or pro-hormone called leptin. And leptin is a really interesting substance. Leptin comes out of our fat stores. When our fat stores are filling up, we produce more and more leptin. The more we're filling up our fat stores, the more leptin we produce. Leptin is a signaling hormone to the brain, telling the brain in normal circumstances that your fat stores are quite full. You don't need to eat anymore. So it's an anti-hunger, anti-appetite hormone. So in a normal functioning human, when you fill up your fat stores with a bit of carbohydrate that's been converted to fat, and you're all nicely in energy balance, leptin tells your brain enough. However, when you are insulin resistant, when fructose and other sugars are having an inflammatory effect in your brain, especially on your hypothalamus, and your blood sugars are elevated, which are also affecting your brain, the leptin signal becomes dramatically reduced. In fact, they're using the term leptin resistance. So we are producing leptin, but the brain can't hear. becomes deaf. All right, But the ultimate result is that there's a reduced leptin signal to the brain. And since the leptin signal is supposed to tell the brain to turn off hunger and you're not getting that signal, the signal for hunger or the brain perception that we are hungry will continue and be magnified. So there is an added component in carb-resistant people and carbohydrates that we are not receiving the signal to stop eating. And if you go and read the literature, you'll read about a leptin. It's very interesting. And out of big bellies, we produce lots of leptin, but our brain can't hear it. Okay. Lots of fat, lots of leptin, brain can't hear it. So, sugar is ubiquitous on earth. It's probably the most ubiquitous macronutrient on earth in its pure form and also the fact that wheat and grains, when you digest them, what does wheat become? Sugar. Okay, we don't eat wheat and measure wheat in the bloodstream. We eat wheat, we eat bread, we measure sugar. In fact, if you want to choose one of the highest GI foods known to science. Okay, let me ask you this question. In my hand, I have a handful of sucrose, table sugar, ready for your coffee. And in this hand, I have a slice of brown bread. Which of the two would you think would have the highest GI? You'd say sugar, hey? The answer is bread. The GI of sugar is about 60 something. About 60, I think. And the GI of brown bread is 78, and the highest GI you can get is 100. So brown bread is converted to sugar faster than table sugar, and there's a reason for that, and I gave you the answer. And you clever oaks didn't notice that, and that is the table sugar consists of two sugars, glucose and fructose. So half of ta table sugar is fructose. Does fructose affect blood sugar? No. It goes to the liver. 
glucose affects blood sugar. So sucrose is converted to less glucose than bread is because bread is made from wheat, which is converted 100% to glucose. So all of you guys saying, I'm having brown bread. Brown bread's okay. Really? It's not okay. <laughs> it's worse than white bread. So our world is alive. Virtually every food stuff that the food manufacturers can put sugar in with and without your permission, and certainly with and without your knowledge, there is sugar. Pizza bases are sugared, especially if the food industry knows that those pizza bases are going to be fed to children. Sugar is in everything. In America, they did uh, an assessment of 600,000 processed foods sold in American supermarkets. They showed that 82% of them had added sugar. Everything from bread to cereals to pizza bases, things that you even wouldn't think of. Sauces, gravies, everything. 80% of 600,000 food products had sugar added to them. So it's a sugary world. <clears throat> this is not an advert for Coca-Cola. Soft drinks and what we classify as sugared beverages that include soft drinks, uh, fruit juices, and things and sugar in your coffee and tea probably account for up to 30% of the calories certainly that children are taking in the form of carbohydrate. In America, adolescents drink two to three Coca-Cola and other soft drinks a day. There is a big campaign to try and reduce it. It is starting, and it is starting to have an impact, but still a dramatic amount of, of, of soft drinks. And two huge studies that just come out of America and the USA, and they show that for every soft drink that you have per day, your diabetes risk increases by 25%. All right? Do you know how much sugar is in a normal can of Coca-Cola? Well, you old guys know, the guys who come before, the new guys, any idea? Have you know? Normal can of Coke, how many teaspoons? 15, 20, start an auction, 30, 30 going once, I don't know. Okay, a normal can of Coca-Cola, which is, is a 330 ml can of Coke, is about 35 grams of sugar that equates to between 9 and 10 teaspoons of sugar. Okay, which is an enormous amount of sugar. You wouldn't consider putting 9 or 10 teaspoons in your coffee or tea and drink this a similar volume. So it just goes to show. Um, if you drink Fanta grape, that goes up to about 15 teaspoons of sugar. If you drink Minute Maid orange juice, it's 12 teaspoons of sugar. Okay, who makes Minute Maid? It's made by the Coca-Cola company. Funny that. Healthy fruit juice made by the Coca-Cola company. It has 12 teaspoons of sugar in it. Right, let me just summarize carb resistance for you. And, and the best way I can explain this to you is it's a journey. Carb resistance, if you have it, is a journey. And it's a journey from Harare to Bulawayo. I come from Bulawayo, so I like going there. Okay, Harare to Bulawayo. And there's a number of towns en route. It's a nice road. Anyone been down the Harare Bulawayo road recently? Something to be quite proud of. It's great. So, we start in Harare with the genetics for carb resistance. We progress to Chigutu where we become overweight. We get to Kadoma where we're continuing to eat a carb, high carbohydrate diet. We are now obese. By the time we get to Kwekwe, we've got high blood pressure and may or may not have coronary artery disease as well. We get to Gweru, we develop prediabetes, which is metabolic syndrome. If we carry on driving down that road, eating our bucket loads of carbohydrate, we get to Bulawayo and get type 2 diabetes. What I want to illustrate to you is that it is a journey. And everyone will walk this journey, but not everybody will necessarily go all the way to Bulawayo. All carb-resistant people who eat excessive carbohydrates over and above their carbohydrate tolerance will gain weight. Some will progress to being obese, some to heart disease, some to prediabetes, and some to diabetes. But it's a journey. They all have the same cause and the same problem. The cause is eating carbohydrates when you have carb resistance genes and develop insulin resistance. Once you have insulin resistance, that bus is en route. Okay. The traditional models of trying to lose weight, combating obesity and overweight, low fat, low calorie dieting, the models of, of yesteryear and still um, profess today are absolutely and utterly useless. The success rates in all major studies of lowering the fat content of your diet or the calorie content of your diet show that the success rates actually are around about 2%. 
over two years. In other words, for every 100 persons who have a weight problem, who go on a low-fat or a low-calorie diet, two out of 100 will have lost weight and maintained that weight loss by 24 months. And in fact, 66% of them will have regained more weight than they started with. Okay, so this traditional form of low-fat, low-carb dieting doesn't work. And there's a fundamental reason why it does not work. And the fundamental reason is that when you deny the body enough calories to sustain itself, the brain simply starts generating a louder and louder signal. What do you think that signal is? Anyone starved themselves recently? Let me tell you what happens when you starve. You get very hungry. And eventually you cannot overcome hunger. It's a primary basic human instinct. It's a survival instinct. You can't ignore it forever. So you start eating. And you start eating more and more. And then you start eating more and more carbohydrates. And if you're carbohydrate resistant, exactly what happens? 95% if not more of these individuals regain that weight in the medium term, and many of them regain more. It is also the reason that exercise is a profoundly useless tool for weight loss. All the years that I, as an exercise professional in medicine, have been telling people to exercise to lose weight, sorry, I was wrong. For 25 years, I lied. I didn't know I was lying at the time. I lied. Why did I lie? I lied because the exercise success rates for weight loss, the figures look very similar to those. And the reason that they look very similar to those is that exercise next to starvation is the second most powerful stimulant of hunger. And that when people go and exercise nice and judiciously and burn off 500 calories, they are very likely to go and eat 535 straight afterwards. And that's not a criticism, it's an observation, it's a biological reality. So exercise very seldom results in sustainable weight loss. Sustainable weight loss, because it is a strong driver of hunger. If we don't sort out nutrition, we don't see sustainable weight loss. And when you take the fat out of your food and you eat a low-fat diet and you eat low-fat granola, what do they do in all these low-fat foods is they add back carbohydrates, usually in the form of sugar, because food that has fat taken out of it tastes like cardboard. And it has no energy in it. So it tastes like cardboard and you're always hungry. That's useless. So what did the food industry, they figured that out long before we did. They said, mm, we can't have food that tastes like cardboard and makes people hungry all the time. So we must put sugar back in. Then it tastes nice and they're not so hungry, but they will become very hungry in three hours. Okay. So a low-fat diet simply means that you're eating a high-carb diet. Simple. And we've already said that carbs make us hungry, they stimulate insulin, and they promote fat storage. So eating a low-fat diet makes you fat. Simple as that. If you are carb-resistant. So this is the number one healthy weight message, and that is that the most important healthy weight intervention, if you are weight-challenged and you are an apple, is to cut carbohydrate from your nutrition program, cutting down the total amount of carbs that you eat, not to zero, but cutting to zero the sugar and refined carbohydrates that you eat. We need some carbohydrate in our diet, but we certainly don't need these things. Okay. So that's the number one message. So eating low carbohydrate nutrition is the way forward from, for controlling, managing, and sustaining a healthy weight. It's not as difficult as you think it is. We are on a program for people who have issues, but it really boils down to cutting sugar from your diet and cutting foods that you know have got sugar in them or constitute a high sugar load. Taking out what I call the white starches, which is pretty much <clears throat> bread, white pasta, white rice, potatoes. Okay, These are white starches. These are very sugary carbohydrates, which are very high in GI. Sticking to healthier carbohydrate sources, all your fibrous vegetables, fruits infrequently, most of the nuts, peanuts are not that good. Peanuts are high in carbohydrate, but the rest of the nuts are okay. Cashews are also high-ish in carbohydrate, but don't stress. 
and small amounts depending on where you are on the weight challenge scale. We wouldn't get our obese patients to eat any of these, not while they're losing weight. If you're only trying to lose six to 10 kilos, small amounts of brown rice, rapok or sweet potatoes, and unrefined maize meal are probably not gonna do too much damage, but small amounts, small amounts are classified as less than a tablespoon and probably only twice a week. Right, so let's go to the next very important part of our macronutrient uh, intake, and that is fats. Fats are a four-letter word. That's why they're spelled F-A-T-S. Women say that fats are a four-letter word, but they're not a four-letter word in that sense. They're a good four-letter word. And the reality is all natural fats are healthy. I'm going to say that again. All naturally occurring fats are healthy. So whether they be animal-based fats, olive oils, avocados, coconuts, fishies, these are considered healthy fats with very little, if any, evidence to suggest that the evidence that was presented in the past that they're bad for you has any validity whatsoever. But I'll make a few refined comments on that. When we look at fats as a group, there are lots of different fats. That's why it's got an S on it. There are saturated fats, there are unsaturated fats, and unsaturated fats can be mono or polyunsaturated. We're not going to have a chemistry lesson. And polyunsaturated fats, there are two important ones in our body called omega-3s and omega-6s. <clears throat> but you would consider animal products probably a saturated fat. Would you, would you agree with that? And dairy to an extent, saturated fats? If I said saturated fats, you'd think of animal, animal fat, dairy fat. Hey? And if I said... Uh, a monounsaturated fat, you'd think of olive oil and you'd think of avocados. And if I said polyunsaturated fat, you'd probably think of margarine. Is that right? Some of you are looking at me like I'm speaking Greek or Latin, but some of you are nodding. That's good. All right, so you're absolutely right that we have been led to believe we, our education kind of suggests to us that there are these different foods that are different fats. But that's actually a myth. Every food that contains fat contains all fats. Every food that contains fat contains all fats, saturated, unsaturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated, but they contain them in varying proportions. And in fact, in meat, most of the fat in meat is monounsaturated fat. And you're all happy to eat olive oil and avocados, which are monounsaturated fat, but some of you have this issue with meat because you've been taught and drummed into you that it's saturated fat. Well, there is saturated fat in meat, but most of the fat in meat is monounsaturated fat. Okay, so there's a predominance of oils in some foodstuffs, but all foodstuffs that contain fat contain all the fats. I'm talking about naturally occurring fats now. And everything that's in blue here, which are naturally occurring fats, are all considered good. We don't talk about bad, we just talk about ugly. So there's good and there's ugly fats. The ugly fats are all man-made manufactured by man, either to substitute the naturally occurring fats in the older nutrition advice, or to make foodstuffs last longer. We make things called trans fats, hydrogenated oils, put them into biscuits and cookies so that you can put them on the shelf in your cupboard and they stay there for three months. You don't need to refrigerate them. They never go off. Why do you think your biscuits go off? They don't go off because they've got hydrogenated, man-made, very ugly trans fats in them. So the bad fats are the man-made fats. To a lesser extent, the bad fats are vegetable oils, but vegetable oils which are high in omega-6s are also, to a large extent, man-made. Fats are a super fuel when you talk about the energy content. I said carbs had a very low energy content at four calories per gram. Fats have got nine calories per gram. This is one of the reasons that they've been demonized for all these decades, because fats got all this energy, therefore fat must make you fat. But fat doesn't make you fat because fat acts in the body in a totally different metabolic manner than carbohydrates. So it has got a very high calorie content, makes it a super fuel. If you want to get a fuel to make your car go further for longer, that's a super fuel. Fats will make you go further for longer. It's a super fuel. Okay. So this physiological fact which created the demonization of fats was grossly incorrect. So these are the bad fats. When we 
hydrogenate vegetable oils, we create trans fats, we use them to preserve foods. The other pro reason <coughs> and the area where we make lots of dangerous fats for the human body is when we repeatedly fry vegetable oil to high temperatures. Vegetable oils will smoke at around about 80 degrees, which is a low temperature. And when oil starts smoking, they start changing into really bad things. Things that are really bad for your heart, really bad for your blood vessels, and can be bad from a cancer point of view. Okay, so repeatedly frying vegetable oils is bad, and which industry repeatedly fries vegetable oils? The fast food industry. So when you guys go and get those chips from those fast food outlets, good luck. And when you give those things to your kids, good luck to your kids, because you're feeding them some of the most dangerous chemicals on earth. Okay, my brother is an organic chemist, and when he was a young organic chemist, one of his first jobs out of uni was going around doing quality control testing on fast food frying outlets. And, and that was 20 odd years ago, I should have listened to him. He told me stories 20 years ago, which I now, having the knowledge I now know, makes my hair stand on end. They knew it 20 years ago from a science point of view, but no one was going to take the food industry on. Okay. These vegetable oils are highly inflammatory in the body, and one of the things that we now know is that high levels of bodily inflammation are intricately related to the development of lifestyle diseases like diabetes and cancer and metabolic syndrome. Inflammation is a role player, a strong role player, and the strongest driver for inflammation in the human body is our intake of vegetable oils and what we do with those vegetable oils and how much omega-6s are we taking in with those vegetable oils? So we don't like them very much. Trouble is, they're cheap. So, I'm not going to say too much about fats this evening. You, those of you who come before, I've said a lot more about them. I just want to deliver this message to you. Intervention number one to reduce heavy weight to healthy weight is to restrict carbohydrates in your nutrition. Healthy weight intervention number two is to eat more healthy fats. You need good energy from somewhere. Fats fill you up quite quickly. I challenge you thus. We take a glass of Coca-Cola and a glass of olive oil, and we do down-downs. Dr. Foggin, you can have the Coke and I'll have the oil. Who's going to win? Oh, okay, you'll have a beer, all right. But you understand the point I'm trying to make. Very easy to drink that glass of Coke. Not very easy to drink down a glass of olive oil, all right? So olive oil fills you up very quickly with small volumes, as do all fats. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to overeat fats. It's a very good challenge if you want to try. They have a high energy density, so once we have the fat on board and we're using it, we're not hungry in two hours. We're lucky if we're hungry in eight because we've got the super fuel to put into the engine and provide what we need. There is no effect of fats on the brain when it comes to appetite stimulation. So unlike carbohydrates and sugars that will profoundly positively stimulate the brain to make you hungry, fats don't do that. So the brain, first of all, gets a signal that there's lots of fuel on board. Energy, pom pom, happy days, and there's no putting pushing funny buttons that say be hungry. So the effect of a lower carbohydrate, higher fat intake, if we go back very quickly to our biology slides, is that insulin spiking will be substantially less. When someone eats food that's got a low carbohydrate content and a virtually nil sugar content and a higher fat content, you're not going to get that spike of insulin. All right? So if we don't get a spike of insulin, we're not going to have carbohydrate to convert to fat. So we're no longer filling up the chugubu, the big drum. And secondly, that the padlocks that lock up the fat stores, which has been driven by high levels of insulin, is reversed. So we're not filling up the fat store. And now these big deposits, these big drums of fuel that we are carrying around are open and the body can access the fuel stores. Once our fat stores are released, the fuel for the body's energy needs, including exercise, are released, and they are profound. They are of large quantity and high quality. 
we are not hungry because the brain is getting constant messages that our fat stores are still full, so the leptin signal is now being heard, and there's just lots of fuel around. There's no need to be hungry. There's no energy deficit. And so what we see in obesity management with lower carbohydrate, higher fat nutrition, individually managed at the individual level for all people. It's not one template for all, but it's a similar program for all as we see substantial losses in body weight and sustainable management of that weight loss if they are able to stick to that nutrition program for the rest of their lives. Okay, so no one's going to be claiming 100% successes. In our program the last two and a half years, we've had very good successes. We're certainly not going to tell you that everyone did well because not everybody finds it easy to stick to the program, not for reasons that the program is hard to stick to, but there are bigger issues which I'm going to talk about just now. So I use the Pac-Man analogy. Once insulin is down, Pac-Man is released into the system and we eat ourselves. That's a nice thing to do. Right, so let me just take the last 20 minutes just to share with you some of the things from the conference. And that's, the, that's really the main message. So for those of you who've not heard low-carbohydrate nutrition before, that is the very essence of low-carbohydrate nutrition. That is the basic science that underpins what we are now saying medically and nutritionally for the management of primarily weight-challenged, obese people, and lifestyle diseases. So a couple of interesting things from the conference, and I'm just going to pick up a point, and I'm going to say a couple of words about it, because if I went slide by slide on these, we'd be here all day. In the, in the area of obesity and weight management we're talking about, one of the speakers was a South African <coughs> surgeon who now is a professor in the United States. He runs a surgical obesity unit where they do various operations to restrict how much people can eat uh, at any one time. But one of the most profound lectures that, that this gentleman gave at this conference was that his obesity surgical unit has an open door into a psychiatric addiction unit and that they do not record success in, and we're talking about extreme obesity, childhood and adult, without the addiction being managed. And one of the strong messages from, from the conference is in very obese people, one of their major challenges is sugar addiction. And it is as bad as alcohol addiction, cocaine addiction, and any other drug. It is that bad. And that was a very interesting point. And that also explains to those of us who've been practitioners in this field and continue to be, that's a problem area. We don't have the resources for that. We certainly haven't grouped those resources together. So addiction, sugar addiction, is a major problem. In fact, in his particular presentation, it is the number one problem. And he said to this audience of, of medical um, professionals, he said, I'm telling you now, you think you have the answer because you've discovered low-carbohydrate, high-fat nutrition, which is absolutely essential to the outcome. He says, but if you don't fix this, there are a large number of people who will never be fixed because they can't overcome addiction. So it's an interesting point, and we're going to have to look at that. The surgical options that he went through, people do opt for bariatric surgery. I used to be quite negative about that, but the reality is I understood very little about it. There are certainly certain bariatric surgical procedures that are very useful in the treatment of severe obesity. That becomes the first stage in the road to recovery. The second stage being the implementation of their nutrition program, and the third stage, the management of their addiction. So having heard um, this professor speak, certainly I am much more versed in very difficult cases to the consideration of certain, not all, bariatric surgical procedures in the assistance of people to lose significant amounts of weight. It does have a definitive role. He showed some very, very good evidence from his, his um, unit. The other very interesting fact that came up is the role of intermittent fasting. And here's the message. Just because somebody invented breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks and snacks, and somehow decided we should all eat five times a day, has got nothing to do with human biology or human physiology. To a large extent, it's probably a myth driven by the food industry because we need to eat more and drink more of what they produce. The message is this, if you are weight challenged and you're trying to lose weight on a low carbohydrate, high fat program, you eat when you are next hungry. Should that be 
in eight hours or in 28 hours, that's absolutely fine. If your fat stores are open for business, just think about it, and I'm not being disrespectful. If you've got a fuel store that, that's bi that is that big, and it is now open for business because you've got your insulin levels down, why the hell do you need three meals a day? You've got 53 meals already on board. So one of the factors we've come across in our, in our clinic is that when we see people reaching, hitting plateaus and struggling to lose weight. One of the things we've gone to their meal plans and they're eating three meals a day. Well, why are you doing that? Are you hungry? No. Well, because there's breakfast, lunch, and supper to be done for the family, so I'm eating. But are you hungry? No. So there is still a factor that calories do come into this. Hunger is the reason to eat. And intermittent fasting is now the most useful intervention to break weight loss plateaus. Just telling people, look, skip a meal, skip a meal. You're not going to die. For heaven's sake, you're 53 kilos overweight. Why are you going to die? From what? From fuel shortage. Unlikely. <laughs> okay. However, if you are hungry every two to three hours, what do you think that indicates? What does that indicate? You're still eating carbs. You're still eating carbohydrates in excess of your tolerance. It means your fat stores are shut. They're not open for business, which means your appetite is going to be stimulated every two to three hours. It becomes a very key internal feedback as to the state of your metabolism. People don't need to keep running back to us. Where are we? Why are we? People need to learn to listen to their own internal biological signals and systems. Another factor was raised is that on a, on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, it's quite easy to eat large amounts of protein. One of the criticisms thrown at this program is that you're advocating a high protein diet. So let me state at the outset, we are not in any way advocating a high protein diet. A high protein diet is advocating protein that's way in excess of 35% of your total calorie intake. And if you eat certainly a program that we construct and the generally advocated programs, they're not. They advocate a protein intake that will go up because a lot of protein comes with the fat sources. There's protein in meat, there's protein in dairy. So protein will go up. But protein normally goes up somewhere in the region of 20 to 25% of your calories, and that's perfectly acceptable and happy for all human beings who've got norm, normal function bodies, normal function kidneys. Okay. If you've got a major kidney problem, yeah, maybe you have to talk to your doctor about where your protein level uh, limits might be. But people still tend to have a, a, a tendency where they might be eating an excessive amount of protein. So the guide for protein has been set now as a palm-sized, palm-sized, piece of protein in area and in width or thickness. If you're eating that amount of protein in, in a meal, you're not exceeding protein intake. Okay, so there are some good guidelines as to what constitutes adequate protein. The other thing about excessive protein, if you eat lots and lots of protein, what your body will do is it actually will convert a lot of it to carbohydrate. So in our livers, this wonderful factory we have in our body, which does all sorts of wonderful magic tricks, it can also convert protein to carbohydrate, to sugar. Okay, so lots of protein can be converted to sugar. What happens to sugar that's in excess? It goes to fat, so it might feed into that fattening cycle we're trying to avoid. Total calories are not dismissed by us playing down the calories in, calories out model. If you eat too many calories, you are very likely to fatten. But if you eat a lot of calories from a carbohydrate source, the metabolic profile of carb and insulin resistance will fatten you at a faster rate. You still need to eat too many calories to gain weight, but it's the metabolic heart of that in carb-resistant people that, that really is, describes and explains obesity. So we haven't dismissed total calories. And if people are intermittently fasting and only eating when they're hungry, they're very unlikely to exceed their calorie requirement for the day. Artificial sweeteners usually come up in question time. Quite a lot said about artificial sweeteners during the conference. So messages, Artificial sweeteners in large amounts are very unhealthy. It doesn't matter what they are. Okay? If you are going to resort to artificial sweeteners as an alternative to sugar, then the natural artificial sweeteners like stevia and xylitol are reasonable alternatives in small quantities infrequently. The artificially manufactured sweeteners like aspartame uh, and all those other ones, I'll list to them, are definitively unhealthy. They are potentially carcinogenic, which means they may cause cancer. 
they upset the bacteria in your bowel and they change the way that we metabolize carbohydrates so they can create even more problems at the level of the intestine and in very carb resistant people they can create a sense of sweetness that is so profound that the brain will stimulate the pancreas to produce insulin even though the blood sugar has not gone up because the sweetness becomes the signal for insulin release so artificial sweeteners Stevia and xylitol are reasonable alternatives and much better alternatives to sugar, but large amounts. Because I know people who swap 10 Cokes a day for 10 Diet Cokes a day. It is definitively unhealthy. And it actually increases your diabetes risk. So 10 Cokes a day dramatically increase your diabetes risk. And interestingly, 10 Diet Cokes a day do so too. Okay, so artificial sweeteners are not the answer if you are an addict. Salt intake. Salt is a very much maligned mineral. We've all been led to believe that high salt intakes are bad for you. Hey, they make your blood pressure go up like through the roof. Well, here's the truth. We only retain salt from our food if we are on a high carbohydrate diet, which is what most people are. So the reason salt has even appeared on the radar is because most people need a high carbohydrate diet. And if you eat a lot of salt on a high carbohydrate diet, you'll retain quite a bit of it. It's the way your kidneys function. I'm not going to go into detail. But if you retain quite a little, lot of salt, the maximum it will put your blood pressure up is between 5 and 6 millimeters of mercury. Doc, is that a lot? That's not a lot. So salt intake has been much maligned. It is not this catastrophic White death, we've been led to believe. Sugar is white death. Salt is not. When you go into a lower carbohydrate, healthier fat nutrition program, I'm no longer talking about low carb, high fat. I'm actually talking about real food, healthy fat, because that's actually the fundamental message. Lower carbohydrate, healthier fat. You actually start excreting salt. You lose salt from your body. So in fact, all of our patients, our very heavy patients, on a high carb, uh, sorry, on a low carbohydrate program. We encourage them to eat salt because after about two weeks, they start feeling a bit dizzy because they become salt depleted. Okay, so salt is an essential nutrient. There's nothing wrong with a pinch or two of salt on your food two or three times a day if you're eating that frequently on a low carbohydrate diet because you are salt losing. You are only salt gaining on a high carb diet. And even if you are salt gaining, it's not the reason you've got high blood pressure. If your blood pressure is 10 or 20 millimeters of mercury above normal, there's something else wrong with you. And here's an interesting fact. In the diabetic clinic, when we put them on a very low carbohydrate diet, their blood pressures fall by 20 millimeters of mercury. And the only thing we've done is removed sugar from their diet. And when we put people on a low salt diet in the old model, the maximum effect we ever measured was four millimeters of mercury drop in their blood pressure, which wasn't going to excite me as a medical practitioner. Fiber. Is fiber important in our diet? Probably not. Okay? Probably not. So all of you, those of you who think you need your fiber to be regular, you probably don't. However, <clears throat> there are a couple of things. Very rough, hard fiber has been shown to actually cause intestinal damage. So all of you eating your bran, and your whole bran, these are like, this is like swallowing a, one of those shower scrubbers that you exfoliate your skin with. So there is a, a good evidence that a very high, highly roughaged fiber intake is actually unhealthy for your intestine. It actually causes trauma to your intestinal wall. Soluble fibers like psyllium, which is used a lot in the cooking in, in low-carbohydrate diets, may be beneficial um, in helping intestinal function. But there is not a huge amount of evidence supporting the fact that we need fiber for regular intestinal action. What is fiber, by the way? Is it protein, carb, or fat? It's a carb. Do we absorb any nutrition from it? No. Fiber is an insoluble form of carbohydrate. Then this wonderful debate and argument that we were all taught for years that we need fruit and vegetables to get our vitamins and minerals. Who believes that? You all believe that. Because that's what we were told. In reality, and this is not anything new, if you go to any textbook of nutrition, any textbook of nutrition, 
And you go and look at which foodstuffs give you the bulk of your vitamins and minerals. The answer is they come from animal products. And you need about this much liver to give you the same vitamins and minerals that you need to eat a barrel of vegetables and fruit that's about this high. So, the message from the nutritionists at the conference is that the bulk of healthy nutrients come from animal products. So, I'm going to come back to fat adaption. So, becoming a vegetarian, they say, is a mistake. It's a mistake. Okay. Due respect to vegetarians, that's another area, and don't take me on, because I'm not going to fight with you. There's nothing wrong with vegetarianism, but it's a much harder nutrition program to get everything balanced and right. How long does it take someone to adapt to all this fat, new energy coming in on a low-carbohydrate nutrition program? And the answer is, if you are not exercising, which actually we don't want you to do if you're very big, because you generally get very injured and then come to the other side of my clinic, which is where we treat the sports injuries, so we don't actually want you to be doing lots of exercise. <clears throat> so if you're not exercising very much, it takes around about, on average, about two weeks for people to start feeling the change. For two weeks, they don't feel great. You've taken away their carbs. You've taken away their sugar. Their whole energy system has to reprogram to fat. And it takes about two weeks. If you're an athlete, it takes longer. And I'll show you that in a second. Next interesting point from the conference was this area of what we call nutritional ketosis. Now, nutritional ketosis is the most extreme form of restricting carbohydrate and eating healthier fats nutrition. It is bringing the carbohydrate content of your diet down to less than 30 grams per day. And lots of people do this. It's certainly a necessity in the treatment of obesity, and it's certainly a, a necessity in the treatment of diabetes. But the point I want to make is it's not necessary for everyone to take the carbohydrates down to these extremely low levels. Nutritional ketosis says that you are producing things called ketone bodies from fat. They make your breath smell a bit acetonish. And the ketones in your blood will rise the more that you are producing ketones from the increasing fat intake. However, ketone bodies, as they are called, are in fact an even more efficient super fuel for the brain, for the muscles, and the tissues of the body. So. Nutritional ketosis is not an unhealthy state, but it's a fairly extreme form of carbohydrate restriction. It has to be differentiated because people kind of run off down a rabbit hole because they only understand half the, the word. There is a term called ketoacidosis, and anyone who's a diabetic will have heard of ketoacidosis. This is a very dangerous uh, form of physiological change in the body, which is pathological when the ketones in the body become very, very high. It normally affects type 1 diabetics, very unusually type 2 diabetics. So nutritional ketosis and ketoacidosis are not the same thing. Nutritional ketosis is a very healthy, very low carbohydrate program where beyond using fat for energy, you produce a group of substances called ketone bodies. But mark my words, ketone bodies are super fuels for brains, hearts, and muscles. We call them clean fuels. Anyone's involved in fuel and energy, we're all looking for clean fuels in terms of running our power requirements of life. These are biological, biologically the cleanest fuels you can put in the human body. Okay. So that nutritional ketosis was much discussed, much debated, lots of evidence presented of where it is relevant. It is relevant to many, but not to all. Messages, you don't have to go down to extreme levels of carbohydrate restriction to enjoy the benefits of lower carbohydrate, healthier fat nutrition. Most of you probably on an average diet, average diet, are eating somewhere around about 300 grams of carbohydrate a day. Athletes who eat high carbohydrate diets eat 500 grams of carbohydrate a day. If you cut that back to 100 grams of carbohydrate a day, three times that, you are by definition on a lower carbohydrate nutrition program and will enjoy health benefits. So you, not everyone has to go into nutritional ketosis. A few words about diabetes specifically updates from the conference. So what's happening in diabetes? Well, this is diabetes. These are American figures, and they reflect the world figures as well. What you can see, you can't read the dates under here, but this is basically, I think this is 1980, somewhere around 1980, when we introduced the new food guidelines telling everyone to eat carbohydrate. It took about 10 or 12 years, and then the diabetic rates worldwide exponentially increased. That is an association that cannot be ignored. 
when the world started eating lots more carbohydrate, diabetes rates grew exponentially. And this is the prediction going through to 2025. So we're somewhere around about here now. So this is the projected WHO uh, figures for diabetes worldwide. It's going to become a disaster to the point where between one and two and one and three people will be diabetic by the year 2040 or 50, somewhere around about there. It'll just be a diabetic world. If you take that the average cost of treating a diabetic in America who gets diabetes at 50 years old and survives eight years with his or her diabetes at 200,000 US dollars per patient, and you quantify that by about 2040, maybe one in three Americans will be diabetic and probably a large amount of the world as well, you will understand that any other budget that you talk about for any other commodity on earth is irrelevant. The future of this world, if we don't stop this curve, is that we will spend everything that we earn and the money that we don't have trying to treat diabetes. And that's a problem. I'm only going to show you one of these graphs because at this time of the evening, God, that looks terrible. Okay, I just want to show you this. The black dots are a control group in an experiment, and the blue dots are a group who are eating a low carbohydrate diet. The top graph is what happens to their blood sugar, and the bottom graph is what happens to their blood insulin levels. And I simply want to show you that when you carbohydrate restrict a, an experimental group of people, their blood glucose levels settle very nicely and stay there compared to the control group where they're all over the place, and their blood insulin levels are very low. And you all now understand the biology of blood sugar and insulin. So is that good or bad? That's particularly good, especially if those people are diabetic. Okay? So carbohydrate restriction works profoundly on blood glucose and insulin levels. And Eric Westman was one of the presenters at the conference. He's a very uh, much published uh, diabetic physician at the Duke University in the States. And he's been pioneering very low carbohydrate nutrition programs for the treatment of diabetes. And this is Eric Westman. I think he gave your talk in his white lab coat, is what you were saying. He's got this trademark white lab coat. He does his lectures in real traditional style. Funny guy. So they cut the carbohydrates down. They put these diabetics into nutritional ketosis. They eat 25 grams or less of carbohydrate a day. Within 24 hours, they have to drop their insulin levels by 50%. So these are severe type 2 diabetics who've progressed to requiring insulin for treatment. If you're a type 2 diabetic using insulin, you're a really bad case because the mild cases are managed by diet, then by drugs like metformin, tablets, then by insulin when you're really bad. So the insulin levels drop by 50% in day one. There is no management study in history that has ever recorded that sort of change in a diabetic treatment. Okay? And here's the most profound figure. By six months in their clinic, 95% of their patients have either eliminated or substantially reduced both their diabetic and their drugs for high blood pressure. They are talking now about curing diabetes. That is a term that in my lifetime as a doctor, I never imagined to hear used. I was taught that diabetes is a chronic disease, that when you have it, we have to manage it and, and keep you safe and reduce your risk factors. We are talking about curing diabetes. How are we curing it? With drugs, not with nutrition. Why? Because diabetes is caused by, you know the story, the trip from Harare to Bulawayo. By having carb-resistant genes, eating too much carbohydrate, becoming insulin-resistant, and traveling all the way to Bulawayo. So when people in America watch this YouTube video, they're going to say, where is Bulawayo? Okay. <laughs> no one. We love Bulawayo. Okay. But you understand, they're talking about cure, and they're not the only clinic that's doing it. Okay. So diabetes, we now believe type 2 is curable. If you're a type 1 diabetic, their insulin levels, they're always going to need insulin. Type 1 diabetics need insulin. They don't have any. But the insulin requirements go down dramatically, which reduces their complication rates and reduces their fatness. Insulin is a fattening hormone. Didn't you know that? So guess what happens when we give diabetics insulin? They get fatter. And 80% of diabetics are obese. So when we treat them with drugs, we, we are stabilizing blood sugar and making obesity worse. And obesity makes their diabetes worse. And we're fighting and chasing our tail the entire time. Because high blood sugar is a symptom of diabetes. It's not the problem. The problem in diabetes is insulin resistance. 
And the treatment for insulin resistance is to restrict carbohydrates in the diet. And for some reason, the established medical community don't get it. But they're getting it slowly. So, we should in time, for type 2 diabetics, no longer see their requirement for insulin treatment. What about heart disease? Is cholesterol really that bad? Well, I think the message from the conference is this. There's a big difference between dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol. If you've been watching the, the news recently, you'll have heard that in America, they're about to remove dietary cholesterol as a risk factor from the list of problems in heart disease. Okay, they've finally woken up to the fact of things that we've been saying for at least 15 years, that there's never been any evidence that cholesterol in your diet affects the cholesterol in your body. But there is still a question mark over the meaning of having high blood cholesterol. Okay, so that is still under the microscope. Why is that? Well, first of all, cholesterol isn't this big bad substance. It's absolutely essential to life. If you didn't have cholesterol, you simply die. You wouldn't be able to reproduce. You wouldn't be able to produce vitamins. You wouldn't be able to produce hormones. You wouldn't have any cells. You'd just be dead. So cholesterol is essential to life. Uh, most of the cholesterol in the human, well, 25% of it's found in the brain and the nervous system. 90% of it is found making up all the cells of the human body, especially in the membranes. We use cholesterol to repair any damaged cell. We make all our sex hormones out of cholesterol. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, the very reason you are either male or female is because you have cholesterol in the human body. And the only reason you're able to absorb fat from your intestines is because you use cholesterol to make bile. So please don't get the message that somehow we evolved a substance to kill ourselves. This, that is ridiculous. Okay? We evolved a substance that is essential to life. Okay, so why and where might it be an issue? Well, what I've just said to you, dietary intake doesn't really matter. We absorb less than half the cholesterol from our, that comes into the gut. Most of the cholesterol in our gut is what's excreted from our gallbladder anyway. And probably less than 20% of anything we measure in the body comes from the diet. So that's irrelevant. Where does most of the cholesterol come from? You remember that organ we keep talking about, the liver? It's an amazing thing. It makes lots of things. And one of the things it makes is cholesterol. So people who've got elevated cholesterol or any amount of cholesterol in their body, most of it's come from your liver. It makes it. And do you think we'd make something to kill ourselves? It seems a bit weird, eh? It is weird. Right, so there are a few relationships between cholesterol and fat. First of all, it might surprise you, cholesterol is not fat. Cholesterol and fat are two totally different things by chemistry. This is cholesterol. Any of you know anything about chemistry? That's a very different compound to fat, which is that. Okay, they're not even related on a chemical scale. However, they share common sources in the diet. We know you get them from dairy and meat. We Actually, there's a link. We use cholesterol in our bile to dissolve fat in the gut so we can absorb it. Cholesterol and fats in a biochemical classification are called lipids. Lipids are substances that don't dissolve in water. Your blood is mostly water. Therefore, cholesterol and fat can't dissolve in your blood unless they are surrounded by a protein. So we surround cholesterol and, uh, and fats in our blood with proteins, which are called lipoproteins. And lipoproteins become the taxi transport system for cholesterol and fat in our human body. So there's no such thing as good and bad cholesterol. There might be good and bad taxis. And anyone who lives in Africa will know about bad taxis because they look like that. Okay. So there is cholesterol and fat all jumping on the same taxi so they can travel around the body. You understand what I'm saying? Cholesterol is cholesterol. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just cholesterol. But it kind of sometimes gets into the wrong taxi, perhaps. So those taxis, I think I just flashed them up on that last one. <coughs> You've heard of these terms, LDL and HDL, low-density lipoprotein, high-density lipoprotein. These are both lipoproteins. They are not cholesterol. They contain cholesterol. And you would have read, if you know anything, that's sometimes called bad cholesterol, and that's sometimes called good cholesterol, which is in itself a load of nonsense because neither of them are cholesterol. They are lipoproteins. They are proteins. They are the taxis of the human body. So when you go to your doctor, he comes to talk to you about this. He says, your total cholesterol has gone up. Ooh, your heart disease risk has gone up. And your LDL has gone up, so your heart disease risk has gone up. And that's what I've been telling people for years. This is a load of rubbish. Okay. Why is it a load of rubbish? <clears throat> well, it's partly rubbish. Because actually, if you go to the research presented at the World Conference, 
Total cholesterol, if it's elevated, is actually only a risk factor if it is very, very elevated. And that is only true in men under the age of 50 years old because they've got a, a genetic disease that creates not only excessive cholesterol, but also excessive clotting factors and excessive inflammation in their arteries and a whole lot of other funny things which are not good for their hearts. So total cholesterol as a risk factor is only true. And what gender is that? Did you see women there? So cholesterol is not a risk factor for women. How about that? It's only for men. And to add to that, Cholesterol in low-density lipoproteins it may be a risk factor if the size of the taxis are little and there's lots of them, but not if they're big. So if you've got small, dense lipoproteins with cholesterol in them, that might increase your heart risk. If your high-density lipoprotein, which is so-called good cholesterol, is low, then your risk is up. And if the fats in your blood are high, your risk is up. So this is a more modern way of looking at your cholesterol results. Now, taxis. You would all accept that driving down the Borodal Road amongst that would be very dangerous. Likewise, if your cholesterol in your body is being carried in all of these taxis, it may potentially be dangerous to your arteries if there is an inflammatory uh, system going on in your body. However, if your cholesterol has been carried around in large luxury buses, nice and safely driven down the road, it doesn't really matter what the level is because those are safe to travel around your body and they don't go getting in the way of arteries and causing mischief. So cholesterol is not quite as simple as your cholesterol is up. That's a wonderful question and here is the answer. So the new model is, for men under 50 years old, a very, very high cholesterol indicates a genetic problem and definitely increases heart risk. If you've got lots of small, dense taxis carrying your cholesterol around, your heart risk is up. If your HDL is low, your heart risk is up. And the fats in your blood are up, your heart risk is up. Okay, what does a high carbohydrate diet, diet do to your lipid profile? Okay, it might reduce it. I'll say something about that. might increase it a bit. It dramatically increases the number of small, dense taxis. It reduces your good cholesterol, and we all know that sugar goes to liver and becomes fat. So when you have more fat in your bloodstream, it didn't come from the fat that you ate, it came from the carbohydrates that you ate. And when you've got lots of fat in your bloodstream, that increases your heart risk. So here's the answer to your question. How do you get like that? Eat that kind of diet. Eat a high-carbohydrate diet, and your cholesterol profiles, inverted commas, look less and less heart-friendly. Okay, because you've got lots of those things. And I said to you that the fat in your diet comes from your carbohydrates because sugar is converted to triglycerides in the liver. What does a low-carbohydrate, healthier fat, what does a real food, healthier fat intake do? Well, it might raise or lower your total cholesterol, but we're not too stressed about that with something I'm going to say later. Your small, dense LDL numbers go down, and your large, fluffy, big bus-like cholesterol taxis, they become more numerous, so your risk factors are going down. Your good cholesterol goes up, often quite dramatically, uh, often by double, two and a half times, which we never see with any other therapy. And the triglycerides in the blood, because you no longer have all the sugar be converted to fat, goes down. So the overall heart disease cardiometabolic risk profile on a lower carb, healthier fat intake goes down. Again, your doctors will sometimes look at me with cross eyes, but that's the reality, and no one will dispute those in any lipid textbook currently available. So more buses. This is just the, and again, all I want you to look on this chart is this. If you see a yellow line going far and is long, that's telling you that a cardiac risk factor is getting less and less. And the yellow lines all indicate what happens on a low-carbohydrate diet, and the red lines is what happens on a high-carbohydrate diet. So what you'll notice is that the cardio, cardiac risk factors for heart disease are in the main going down dramatically, and much more so on a low-carb, high-fat diet than on a high-carb diet. Okay, don't worry about the details. If it's yellow and it's going long, that's good for your heart. Okay, and the yellow and going long are the changes created by a low-carbohydrate, healthier fat program, and that's produced from a very good study that was published by Jeff Folek and colleagues in 2008. So, a couple of things about heart disease. We're going on. We're nearly done. 
Cholesterol, no. Cholesterol is essential to human life. Dietary saturated fat and cholesterol do not significantly affect total cholesterol levels or lipoprotein levels. Um, there is an association with, uh, this is cholesterol is associated with, but is not a very strong predictor of coronary heart disease. It's a very weak predictor. It's not a heart disease risk factor in women, and it's not thought anymore to be very significant in older men. Not old men, because I'm 50, so I'm not old, older. Okay? Arterial inflammation is a major factor in coronary disease, and arterial inflammation is far more associated with the level of refined carbohydrates and levels of blood sugar and insulin than they are with elevated cholesterol. So arterial inflammation is required with probably small dense LDL for people to get heart disease. So if you don't infl have inflammation, the debate is what is the role of cholesterol? We don't know the answer to that yet. And those vegetable oils and trans fats, which might actually decrease cholesterol and keep your doctor happy, cause dramatic increases in arterial inflammation and are strongly associated with heart disease risk. So what we were doing 20 years ago, we were all eating margarine and the, our cholesterol went down in our blood, which was nice, and our heart disease risk went up, which was not nice. Right. A couple of things that came out of the conference, low-carb, high-fat diets and cholesterol. Most people eating more fat and more saturated fat do not see any change in their total cholesterol. Most see those heart healthy changes I showed you on the yellow bars going more healthy. Some experience mild to moderate increases in total cholesterol which come down after about four to six weeks which is thought to reflect the release of cholesterol from the fat stores that are being liberated. We store cholesterol in fat stores. So we know the fat stores are being liberated, so cholesterol comes into circulation. So some people do experience temporal increases. There are a few cases, less than 30% so far of studies that have been done, and there are not a lot in the literature, who have what we call an outlier response, which is a dramatic increase in total cholesterol. We do not know the impact on heart health because no studies for 10 or 20 years have been done. However, we do know that they have dramatic reductions in arterial inflammation because they no longer have high sugar and high insulin. So if they don't have sugar and insulin, is the very high cholesterol a risk factor? The other thing we know is that the size of their cholesterol gets bigger. Not their cholesterol, remember? The taxis. The LDL gets bigger, so that's safer. So there's more cholesterol, but it's in bigger taxis. Their good cholesterols go up as much as their Inverted commas, bad cholesterols go up, and an elevation in good cholesterol is a good in bad cholesterol. When your HDL goes up, which is your good cholesterol, that's a good thing. Are you with me? I hope I haven't lost you with cholesterol. But this is an area which we all accept in this field where more research is required, and we're looking at these outliers. Interestingly, I am one of them. Okay, so I'm very interested in where we're going. Right, lastly, a little bit, second last, a little bit about cancer. What you eat definitely has a role in cancer. There were some fantastic presentations on cancer at this world conference <clears throat> and backed up what I have said before about cancer. Number one fact, 95% of cancer cells cannot use any other energy substrate other than sugar for their energy processes. Cancer cells feed on sugar. Okay? They can't use fat, they can't use protein. So the evolving links show very strong links between levels of sugar intake, how much insulin is circulating around the body, and there's another interesting little substance called insulin-like growth factor on human cells, which also is involved with sugar metabolism, and the inflammatory effects of high amounts of omega-6 fatty acids. Where do omega-6s come from? From the vegetable oils, and also from animals that have been fed with lots of grain. Okay, so we know that we're all taking in too much omega-6, and it's highly inflammatory, and there are strong links now between those and cancer. Cancer cause? Maybe, maybe. Cancer progression? Definitely. So we know that other diseases of lifestyle, heart disease, diabetes, and obesity are strongly associated with an increased occurrence of the hormone-sensitive cancers, breast, uterus, ovary, colon, prostate. Okay, so people with diabetes have much higher risks of these cancers. People who are obese have much higher risks of these cancers. So there's commonality and links. These are all strongly associated, these cancers, with an excessive intake of sugar and refined carbohydrates, especially in this group of people, carb-resistant, 
insulin resistant. We used to do all our research into why cells became abnormal in cancer development, what mutated, what damaged the DNA. That's almost going by the wayside. It never provided the answer. It never provided the solution. We are now looking more and more as why and how do cancer cells not just die? Human cells that are damaged are programmed to self-destruct. It's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. If abnormal can't be fixed, kill switch. <laughs> cancer cells don't do that. They're abnormal and they just keep growing. So we now know that this is all tied to the metabolism of cancer cells, and the metabolism of cancer cells is tied to sugar. And this gentleman is a renowned oncologist who wrote a book called Outliving Cancer, and he said this in a very nice quote. He said, cancer cells don't grow too much. They die too little. Okay, why don't they self-destruct? This German gentleman called Otto Warburg in 1931 got the Nobel Prize. So in 1931, we knew that cancer cells only use primitive glycolysis, which is the burning of sugar to produce energy. They don't use the efficient systems that all other human cells have, using a thing called the mitochondria, which is like a carburetor in your cells to produce energy very efficiently. They use this inefficient primitive method. They will then thereby burn up to 200 times more sugar than normal cells will. How do the hell do they get all that energy? Well, they corrupt the metabolism of cells. They have more insulin receptors on the outside of cancer cells. They have got more insulin-like growth factor receptors. So they basically go around like a sheepdog corralling sheep, like a cowboy corralling cows. They go and gather up all the sugar, and they feed it all to themselves. So cancer cells are able to corrupt the metabolism of the human body so that they get all the sugar. That allows them to do a couple of things. It allows them to command the sugar supply, to have lots of energy, to grow and proliferate and to protect themselves against self-destruction. They use the chemicals that they produce by glycolysis to disable the kill switch. And we're learning this more and more in the modern cancer research. They also produce lots of things called oxygen-free radicals. And they use these oxygen-free radicals to attack the cells that are around them, the normal cells, destroy them so they can go take the protein from them so they can put them into their new babies so they can grow. And they get these free radicals from the glycolytic energy system. So cancer is a very clever animal. So the message is, and the message very strongly from the conference, sugar feeds cancer. We're not saying it causes it, it feeds it. It may have a role in causation, and I found this, I like this, sugar is to breast and other cancers as cigarettes are to lung cancer. Okay, there is a direct and close relationship. We see this on scans that we use to monitor cancer patients. We use a thing called a PET scan, and a PET scan will light up a tumor. And it lights up a tumor because we program it to take up radioactive, radio-labeled sugar. We give them radio-labeled sugar, and we can see all that sugar going into the tumor. Can you see these bright lights? This is a person's pelvis. On a PET scan, there is a tumor in their pelvis. And this person, luckily, after treatment, the tumor had gone away. Okay. This person has got a tumor in their thigh. This is the knee. This is a muscle sarcoma in the thigh. Look how it's sucking up all the sugar that we fed that into the bloodstream. And it didn't get better after treatment. So we use PET scans to look for tumors, to look for spread, and to monitor the effectiveness of treatment. The reason I'm showing you this is what makes a PET scan light up is sugar inside a tumor. We feed that. Do you see anything else lighting up? A tumor is like a vacuum cleaner for that radioactive sugar. So... What do we know about cancer? Inflammation is a fertilizer for cancer growth. I told you that lifestyle uh, suffering disease people have got much higher risks. We know that obesity influences its growth and, and development and treatment. We know that cancer cells proliferate in a high sugar environment. Um, you double your risk of breast cancer if you've got a high trans fat omega-6 vegetable oil intake. Interestingly, if you have a high cholesterol, your cancer risk is less. If you have a very low cholesterol, your cancer risk is higher. How about, there's a good reason to have a high cholesterol. And what we know from modern research is that environmental factors of which diet is the predominant are probably the 80% factor in cancer development. The 80% factor. And that genetics and damage to cancer cells may only be a 15 or 20% factor. 
Okay, so environmental factors are more important than the genetic damage that starts it off. Sorry about the spelling. Cancer has a strong metabolic basis. There is a metabolic model now to understand it and probably by which to treat it. Diet changes the nurture possibly more so than the nature of cancer. Diet is not the cure for cancer. No, we're not saying that. I'm not standing here with some naturopathic hypothesis that we can cure cancer with diet. But diet will become and is increasingly becoming a vital part of a broad strategy. If we're using radiotherapy and chemotherapy, a low carbohydrate diet actually protects the normal cells from the damage created by chemo and radiotherapy. When we treat people with chemo and radio, it's not just the cancer cells that suffer, the whole body suffers. And people on a low carbohydrate diet have less side effects from treatment than people who are on a high carbohydrate diet. So it's got a big role to play, and it may slow down the rate at which cancer cells are growing. So we're looking at a future of medically driven targeted treatments to cancer which include nutrition. Last two slides, because there's a few athletes who came to listen to things. <clears throat> we had some really good presentations by Steve Finney, and I think he talked to you on the Sunday as well. Okay, he's brilliant. <clears throat> About the use of low-carb, high-fat in exercise and performance, and I'm not going to say too much. Most of the evidence comes from anecdotal testimony from athletes. What is really interesting is that more and more closet low-carbohydrate athletes are coming out of the closet and admitting that for years they've been doing it they were just too scared to say it because they have been declared heretics because we have always said high carbohydrate for exercise. Paula Newby Fraser, Zimbabwean, rated the greatest female athlete on earth of modern times. Won how many Ironmen's have? Goodness knows, but she won the most Ironmen triathlons in history. Admitted recently to Tim Noakes, my former prof, that she ate a, a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. She never listened to his nutrition advice for all those years, and she was the most successful female athlete in history over long distance. So, and there's lots more. There's this guy who's a three time winner of the 100 mile Western United States run. He runs that run 100 miles, 150 Ks on a bag of peanuts and a bag of biltong. If you look at the carbohydrate he should have eaten on a high carbohydrate diet, you would have needed a truck following him to keep fueling him up. Okay, so we know that the athletes have been doing it, and there's lots more that are trying it. There is some not huge amount of laboratory research, a lot of it done by Steve Finney and Michael Jeff Folek, but it is pretty good research to show that athletes can adapt very well to using fat for their primary fuel instead of carbohydrate, but it takes them a little bit longer. They will not be fully adapted at two weeks because if they're still training, it takes a bit longer. It takes somewhere between six weeks and three months for an endurance athlete to fully adapt to a high-fat diet. So it's not something that someone should start two weeks before the Olympics. The Australians ran an excellent program before the 2010 London Olympics. They ran their endurance athletes on a low-carb program for training, and they only gave them carbohydrate for racing, which is a kind of in-between. And it worked really well, and the research that's been published was very good. So it's certainly there, and it certainly works. Some of the things that we know from the laboratory research is that a fat-adapted athlete can almost double the rate at which they burn fat for exercise over someone who's using carbohydrate. Which is a better fuel? Fat is a better fuel. It's a super fuel. So you're not going to need as much to keep refueling. So the other thing is that we're always taught that you need carbohydrate to go fast. You can use fat when you're jogging, but in order to go fast, you've got to put fast-burning carbohydrate. The only reason we ever knew that or thought we knew it was because the experiments were only done on athletes eating high carbohydrate. Now we're experimenting on athletes eating high fat, and guess what? They are able to actually increase the rate that they burn fat up to the same levels that they do carb, and they can go fast on fat, which we never thought was physiologically possible, and it is. Their health markers in the medium term are better because they're not eating so much carbohydrate. They don't get as much tummy trouble, especially on long runs, because the more you take those horrible gels and goos, the more your intestine is likely to reject you. And any of you who have tried that will know what I'm talking about. So if you're not having to take carbohydrate on the run, you just need a bit of biltong and nuts. Your guts are happy with that. You spare the glycogen that you might need stored in your muscles, and you spare protein. You don't break it down unnecessarily because you don't run out of energy. Another interesting effect of uh, fat ad adaptation athletes is they tolerate altitude much better than carb-fed athletes. So if they're racing at altitude, they, they perform better. 
They suffer less damage to their muscles from intensity exercise, so the recovery is much quicker. They're able to do much more in the days after a very tough event than a carb-fed athlete because they're not as sore. Their muscles are not as damaged. They suffer less um, brain-driven fatigue because they're not depleting their glycogen stores uh, to the point where they run out of fuel. They recover much faster. And as I said, the Australian Olympic research up to 20, was it 2010 or 2012? When was London? 2012, yeah. So 2012 showed very good performances where they trained low carb and raced on high carbohydrate, which is a sort of middle of the road program. Right, you guys have been incredibly patient. Summary, if you want to be lean and healthy, cut the carbs, shovel in the healthy fats. Eat a low carb, higher fat, moderate protein, and do some exercise because it's good for your health. It's not necessarily good for your weight loss. We're modifying this now. We're talking about real food and healthier fat. So you're going to see more and more real food, healthier fat because that's really what we're talking about. Eat foods that nature provided, whole foods. More whole foods will provide the nutrition that we should be eating and healthier fats are not bad for you and protein comes along for the ride. The last two slides, things are often started with because they're profound facts. The primary fuel for providing sustained energy to humans and their cells is fat. The primary building blocks for human tissues are protein, fat, and cholesterol. I don't see carbohydrate in those two things. And carnivorous populations, humans that still and have been studied that only eat fat and protein and very little in the way of carbohydrate actually don't develop vitamin deficiencies which is hardly surprising because I told you that most of the vitamin minerals come from animal products. Anyway, if you eat a diet that has absolutely no fat, you die quite quickly. If you eat a diet with no protein, you die moderately quickly. And if you eat a diet that's got zero carbohydrate, you live happily ever after. So the message is carbohydrate is not a requirement for human existence. It's not a nutrient that we need to eat. You can eat it if you're fine and you're carb tolerant and your weight's stable. There's no problem with that. But it's not something that we need. Okay. And this from the conference is the final slide I'll tell you. I've talked about diseases of lifestyle that benefit from a low carbohydrate nutrition program. This is the list that was produced at the conference of diseases that are showing increasingly uh, improvement with the use of low carbohydrate nutrition as part of their treatment strategy. Childhood epilepsy, we've known about that for about 100 years, okay? Polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, reflux, irritable bowel, celiac disease, gallbladder disease, gout, rheumatoid arthritis, um, ADHD in children, autism in children, migraines and Parkinson's disease, and this list is growing. So that's what I'm saying, and I said at the beginning, nutrition is becoming the medical intervention strategy of the future in diseases of lifestyle. Not necessarily the only treatment, but a substantial part of that strategy. If we ignore it, we're ignoring a very useful tool. This is a program that we run, and there are flyers if you're interested, and Linda can give you more information, but we run a program for weight and health management using nutrition for people who feel they need extra help and guidance. We're very happy to do that. I'm currently writing a book, which is very exciting, and I think it's going to come out, hopefully, if my wife stops kicking me in the next month or two, we'll have it published and it'll be another very good guideline in this area of low-carb nutrition and showing people how to cook and how to prepare food. But there are some good things also that are already on the market to do that. So guys, those of you who need to go to Tin Roof, you must go. Thanks very much for listening. The snacks, I think, are there if you wish to partake. And I'm happy to take any questions.